Iran, the question of the freedom of the will is a perennial one, and I've been talking to philosophers on both sides. Where I'd like to get grounded is with the brain science, the cognitive neuroscience of what people are doing in terms of decision-making uh, in, in, in real data. Right. I, uh, I sometimes think I'm an empirical philosopher. <laughs> so I'm interested in the philosophical question, but if I can answer it empirically, I'm going to do experiments. If I cannot, I'm going to do Gedanken experiments. Thinking, thought experiments. Thinking about it. Well, in this case, we have experiments that we could have run, and we, in fact, ran. So the split brain case shows a very dramatic example of how free will can be dissociated from your intention in the sense, in the following sense. So we have two different halves of the brain of a split brain patient. We have two different intentions to act. They don't communicate you've because you've split it have surgical. Split. And we've seen examples of that where one hand fights with the other in selecting a dress or in trying to solve a problem. Each one has a different intention and that's possible and therefore it, ma it makes it possible to have independent sensation, perception, memory, decision and action in each side. All so of that. All of that in each side separately. That means each side is separately conscious, has a separate intention, a separate free will, and a separate moral responsibility, therefore. So far, seems okay, but what if they are in conflict with each other? Suppose one does something the other one doesn't like, or that society doesn't like. So suppose we find that um, a split-brain patient has committed an, a, a social act, in fact a crime. One side committed a crime, the other side did not. In fact, we can show that at that time, one side was dominant. Why do you assign uh, guilt or moral responsibility? Here's a case where talking about a person as a unified whole is misleading because, in fact, it was one half of the person that made the decision, perpetrated the act, and therefore should be morally responsible. Why do you publish, uh, punish the other side? And yet, how do we punish one side and not the other? So that may be a model case for more general situations where we act in one configuration of cognitive and emotional forces that are active in a particular situation, but it may not be the same as the one we have a minute later. So how do we say, given that we were driven to give, to, to act in a certain way, how do we say that we have freedom of the will? It's all biologically determined. Well, what's as far, my answer, unsatisfactory probably from a philosophical point of view, is that with, as long as it is within our ability to control these processes, to modulate them, to prevent a certain action from occurring, we are morally responsible. The legal questions, I think, are one level that can be dealt with. I, I, I want to get to the neural, uh, the, the, neuro, the ontological, the, 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 re, the level of, of, of reality and existence. What do we have here? Do we have the illusion of free will? Because we all feel we have free will, except maybe some, some uh, uh, psychiatric patients. But we all have this illusion. Is it an illusion or is it a reality? What can we say from brain science? You don't, you don't believe in anything other than materialism. Absolutely. The brain is it. Consciousness is somehow Absolutely. derivative uh, in some way. So if there's nothing but materialism, what, do, what can we say about the, it, the, the feeling that we are in control of our own actions? If everything's determined by what's happened before. Yes, but what's determined by what happened before is also our ability to change our behavior, to modulate things, to stop the emotion from controlling our behavior, or so and so on. And sometimes we are more prone to that than others. When I start eating peanuts, I cannot stop. I have an addictive element to my personality. Am I free to stop? Yes, but I'm less free than I was before I started eating it. <laughs> so it is my ability. So certainly my freedom is constrained by my biology and determined by it. But at the same time, that biology allows me prefrontal cortex influence from the top to modulate these effects and to strategically not eat the peanuts if I know it's going to do that, or to stop eating it in spite of the strong emotional need because I know of what it will do to me. It's that freedom to act differently, which is part of my biology, determined nonetheless, allows me to have some control, and that to me is, the part, is what I mean by freedom. 
So you feel completely comfortable being a 100% materialist, physicalist, eliminating anything else in the universe and believing in the totality of, of the freedom of the human will. Completely comfortable is an exaggeration, but it is the best I can do, yes. <laughs> Because some would say that if you're going to be consistent in, in, a, in a neuroscience basis, you're going to see that whether you eat the peanuts or you don't eat the peanuts it is the result of some prior biological process. Because it all, at the end of the day, has to be something expressed in the, in the electrical activities of all your neurons working together. There's no you, in your opinion, that's in charge of that process and can and can change that those those patterns of, ah, of but there activities. is a you there is a me in okay. charge of these processes but it's part of this it's inside here and it may be in the prefrontal cortex or somewhere in the brain that monitors behavior evaluates outcome and can change strategies and change give some priority to some things rather than but others but it does that in a purely mechanistic way yes of course in, in the sense that it's all brain control but it is not determined in the sense that it allows me the range of activity. In other words, I can still control my behavior. That mechanism has a range of behaviors that it is capable of. A, a uh, psychiatric patient may not have that freedom. A schizophrenic patient who hallucinates doesn't have the same range of activity. So a criminal may have something wrong with his corpus callosum. That means his ability to interact through the corpus callosum is limited. My ability is more free, has a larger range. That's what makes it able for me to have a free. This is a very profitable area to, to probe because you then begin to have a comparison of levels of freedom exactly. based upon certain brain states, and that can allow us to extrapolate back to a full normal person if you see those different gradations. Exactly. So describe for me the, the different... Uh, examples of people who through psychiatric conditions or neurological conditions have the apparent uh, freedom being uh, uh, constrained at different levels. Right. So, I mean, here is a case where what you know about what you do and what you can do is not the same thing and therefore your ability to control it is impaired. So, let's think of cases where this, is occur where this occurs. A... Um, an amnesic patient doesn't remember an occurrence, an event. He's exposed to a list of words. When you ask him to recall the list, he cannot. He doesn't remember ever being ever seen the list. You ask him, can you come up with the was the word market in there? He doesn't know. Tell me a word that starts with M-A-R that was in the list, he doesn't know. But then you tell him, come up with any word that comes to your mind that starts with M-A-R. Market. And in fact it was in the list. So when he doesn't want to, it comes up. So here's a case where his ability to monitor his own behavior is impaired. He doesn't know what he actually knows. And yes. And, and this type of an example can show us um, the, 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 that when you impair a function and then you go back and say if it's all there, you can see what the, 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 the fully healthy version is so you can appreciate it better by seeing the different levels of degradation. It's not exactly. just there or not. Exactly. And that's the whole point. You look at the damaged brain, I'm looking at the damaged brain, not because I'm interested in the disease and curing it, which is important and very worthwhile, but because I want to understand normal function. And normal function is continuous with any model of normal function has to account for pathology. And we need to be able to explain why, one, by explaining the other. Now this has normally been done just for generalized brain function, what different structures have what different functions. Now we're trying to probe more, more subtly and to say what can it tell us about the freedom of the will. And right. that, that in these different types of patients, when their ability to make decisions in, in, in a free sense is impaired, what that says about the normal case. What, what are some other examples? I mean, another example is the man who mistook his wife for a hat. So, I mean, Oliver Sacks' example of a patient who has a uh, visual agnosia. He cannot perceive the meaning of objects. He can copy them precisely, but he cannot perceive the meaning of an object. He, doesn't rec he cannot recognize uh, what he sees. Is he therefore responsible for reacting to those stimuli in the appropriate manner? The answer is no, because his mechanism doesn't allow him to appreciate the significance. So we want the brain to explain how we come to meaning, and then to show whether or not we have the ability to control it. And the brain sometimes is dissociated from the behavior. Here's an example of a situation where 
there is a dissociation between what a patient knows and what uh, her brain does. And in that sense, we see that her freedom to act is constrained by her brain state. Here's a dramatic example. So we try to show some words to the right hemisphere, and the right hemisphere has to decide, I talk as if it's a person, because I believe that, whether there are words or not words in English. Presses one button if it's a word, another button if it's not a word. Cannot do that. Cannot do it. Too difficult. And yet, at the same time, we measure the brain activity over her right hemisphere by putting electrodes over the right hemisphere. We're looking at a gamma range, some range of activity, and it shows a strong difference, reliable, consistent difference between words and non-words, meaning her brain can tell apart words from non-words, and yet she is unable to tell me the answer. That means that there is some discontinuity or some disconnection between her brain state and her cognitive state, if you wish. Very, very interesting, because this, this affects directly of what we imagine our freedom to be. Exactly. And it's, it's one example of what could be a myriad of different possibilities that would interrupt the normal freedom. And it shows that freedom is directly related to brain states. Exactly. It is even more dramatic when you think that the gamma frequency, which is the activity that showed the difference between words and non-words, is often believed to be the consciousness frequency. <laughs> And here it is associated with complete lack of consciousness. <laughs> so what the, the point is that there are many different levels of probing the mind, and it can show us that there is some activity in the brain that can process the information, but that is not, does not mean that it's all available, available to us to act on. And to the extent that it's not available to, uh, to, for us to act on, we are not free to operate on that information. It's not available even though part of the brain is reacting to it. So if one is entirely materialistic about the issue of freedom of the will, this perennial philosophical question, one would have to say that it is a continuum. Exactly. And it's a continuum that is directly related to brain states. Exactly. And we can show that the same stimulus, some uh, stop sign, makes me able to stop when I drive and I don't think about it, but makes me unable to refer to that as a stop sign when somebody asks me about it. So depending on what behavior I probe, my freedom to act is very different. Which shows the richness, the complexity, but ultimately the pure physicality? Of the process. Now some philosophers might say that uh, uh, real freedom of the will you can only have if you have some other substance besides the material world. And philosophers who are purely physicalists are actually divided. And, and some say you can have freedom of the will through some, I don't know, quantum effects or who knows what, chaos theory. Uh, whereas others reluctantly say, if I'm going to be consistent in my materialism, I have to have a deterministic position that there is no freedom of the will. Right, and my view is a cop-out where I'm taking a purely materialistic point of view and I say what, what for me is freedom of the will is the ability to modulate certain range of behaviors. If I can control the phenomena, if I can make myself behave one way or another, I don't care if it was determined ahead of time that I had that ability, that's what I call freedom. My ability to modulate the behavior, modulate the condition, modulate my reaction, if I'm addicted, if I have no control, then I'm unable, I don't have the freedom. But if I have the ability to modulate it, subject it to other considerations, to other parts of the brain, to make the connection with other parts of the brain more active, then I'm free. And this pragmatic approach to freedom of the will is supported by the neuropsychological data, cognitive psychology, cognitive neuroscience that you do. Exactly. And that's why I believe it. Or maybe that's why I do that kind of neuropsychology. Exactly.